pro et contra. For this week's guest, we are joined by Jeffrey Sachs. He is a world-renowned professor and author, director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. An expert in many fields with decades of experience, uh, including uh, advising the uh, Russian government after the Soviet Union and seeing firsthand the impact of U.S. policy there, which uh, he now is calling out when it comes to the proxy war in Ukraine. He's been an outspoken critic of that, also of the Israeli genocide in Gaza. And we're going to speak to Professor Sachs about those issues and a lot more. Welcome to Useful Idiots, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. We're so thrilled to have you on. I'm delighted to be with you. Thanks a lot. I wanted to ask you about something that you said. In November, you addressed the UN Security Council to talk about four major wars, the war in Ukraine, Syria, Israel-Palestine, and the Sahel. And you said, These wars may seem intractable, but they are not. Indeed, I would suggest that all four wars could be ended quickly by agreement within the UN Security Council. Is that still your assessment? And if so, how would that happen? I think we always should refer back to von Clausewitz, who said that war is the continuation of politics with other means. And what he meant by that is that wars reflect political disagreements. And so you end wars not on the battlefield typically, or and you shouldn't, but rather through solving the politics. This is true in Ukraine. It's certainly true uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, and so forth. So yes, I take that position. And if the Security Council would uh, act in a proper way, uh, it could end all of these wars very, very quickly. If you, if you, if you want me to elaborate, uh, yeah. you know, one sentence on on uh, Ukraine is: this is a war over NATO enlargement. It it always has been. It remains so till today. I just saw that uh, Secretary of State Blinken said again today that uh, Ukraine will become part of NATO. Well, it'll, it, it, it may uh, disappear before that happens. Russia is not going to have it happen for completely understandable reasons. Uh, and uh, Blinken's statement just shows how, in my view, how imbecilic uh, U.S. foreign policy has been for decades uh, over this. And this war has now been going on for 10 years. Uh, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, uh, the issue has been staring us in the face, in my view, for 57 years, which is uh, there need to be two states. Uh, they don't have to like each other. Uh, they need to be separated from each other. Uh, but my recommendation in the Security Council was and is immediately recognize uh, the state of Palestine as the 194th UN member state on the 4th of June, 1967 borders. Do that, do that today. Uh, and then uh, we uh, don't have a mystery of a so-called peace process, which is phony and never going to happen. Uh, we know what the boundaries are and uh, then we can get to a few remaining practicalities. Uh, so uh, those uh, wars, pretty clear what the politics is about. The politics of the Sahel is also quite clear extreme impoverishment, uh, extreme impoverishment uh, with uh, a Western world that could care less about extreme impoverishment. Uh, so this is uh, a another case where uh, even a modest development uh, strategy would change everything for these absolutely impoverished uh, landlocked countries in Western Africa. And when it comes to Syria, we know exactly where the war came from. It came from the Oval Office of the United States uh, and uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Uh, one day, Obama and Clinton said, OK, uh, we have to overthrow uh, the government of Syria. That was back in 2011. Mind boggling, but typical, typical of the U.S. Uh, we get to choose which country, uh, who's going to rule other countries. Uh, this is one of you know around 100 regime change operations of the U.S. since the end of World War II. And it, like most of them, it failed incredibly. Uh, but to this day, we continue 
with our uh, military presence, with our troops, with uh, trying to undermine the Syrian government. So again, this is politics about the most mind-bogglingly stupid of all of them, though, because this really was a willful decision just to overthrow a government in 2011, not even for any obvious, obvious reason, however bad, just that they decided from certain point, well, this guy we got to take out and uh, assign the CIA to do it. So these are wars that reflect underlying politics that is pretty messed up. Most of it I trace back to the United States. Uh, you know, when you're trying to be the world's hegemon, uh, you're trying to do something which is uh, completely delusional. And, and that is the nature of U.S. foreign policy. You know, there's a very famous clip of you from Morning Joe on MSNBC uh, laying out what you just did about the dirty war in Syria. And we know uh, they sent in the CIA to overthrow Assad. The CIA and Saudi Arabia together uh, in covert operations tried to overthrow Assad. It was a disaster. Eventually it brought in both ISIS as a splinter group to the jihadists that went in. It also brought in Russia. So we have been digging deeper and deeper and deeper. What we should do now is get out. And I believe that's one of the few times, if not maybe the only time on U.S. corporate television in the last decade when those facts were allowed to be said. I'm just curious, have you been allowed back on MSNBC since then? Do you, do you remember? Uh, I, w I was allowed back on since then, but I haven't been allowed on uh, since uh, <laughs> since Ukraine, that's okay. for sure. <laughs> Fair uh, and and, uh, and uh, my my last mainstream, I think my last mainstream appearance on uh, U.S. Uh, television media was on Bloomberg when I said, uh, yeah, the U.S. probably blew up uh, Nord Stream. And uh, they took me off the air literally within 30 seconds. And uh, never once more did I hear an invitation from anybody that had normally asked me on, I'd say, every two weeks to every four weeks, whether it was Morning Joe or Tom Keen on uh, on Bloomberg or any place else. It's a complete shutdown. Okay, I'm, I'm not suffering from it, but it's pathetic. Uh, and it's a complete shutdown uh, in the mainstream print media. I can't get in 700 words. And that's online, you know, when it's you're not exactly limited on the New York Times. Uh, when they have said everything like three-year-olds about the Ukraine war. I, I don't know whether they're as stupid and ignorant as they sound or whether they're just simply directed from above. But I ask at one point, give me just 700 words. Let me say why your incessant inanity that this is an unprovoked war need, needs a little bit of uh, qualification. And uh, after weeks and weeks of going around, uh, begrudgingly, the editor said, okay, 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 okay. So I sent the piece. It got edited. It got put into uh, New York Times font. Everything. I was oh, I was chortling. I did it. I got through. I got it. And then I got an email from uh, a junior editor. Uh, well, so sorry, Professor Sachs. We're not going to be able to run your piece. So uh, that was uh, that. That was in. Uh, 2023. And then uh, a few weeks ago, just to uh, finish uh, th this bizarre world, a uh, uh, New York Times editor reached out to me and said, you know, we'd be interested in your thoughts about uh, Pakistan and the Pakistan elections. Okay. So I wrote, uh, I think shouldn't have been surprising for them that it wasn't a great idea for the U.S. to uh, uh, help to overthrow Imran Khan. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Sachs, we can't have that in our pages. <laughs> and so, okay, this is uh, how it is. And weren't you also hushed up, like silenced when you talked about, I think, the U.S. or Britain? You talked about Western violence or Western imperialism, and you were interrupted. That was another time that you were. That was in a uh, democracy forum of the New York Times. You could be democratic at home and ruthlessly imperial abroad the most violent country in the world since 1950 has been the United States. It's Jeff, been by let's, far involved Jeffrey, in more, stop wait, now. In more let's, wars. Let's, let's, Jeffrey, I'm, 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 Jeffrey, I'm your moderator, and it's enough. Okay, I'm done. 
I, I forgive the moderator uh, a little bit because I was probably running on a little too long. But in any event, I think uh, also the content was probably a little annoying to the sponsors. It's sort of like, you know, we only get uh, the U.S. government to admit to taking part in coups 50 years after the fact. So, for example, the, the CIA coup in Iran in 1953, we're still learning about that. So I figured that the New York Times probably is on the same pace. As soon as the U.S. government finally admits something, 50 years later, they'll let you write about it. So in 50 years, Professor Sachs, I'm sure we'll be getting your op-eds on you. I've, I've got my piece already, you know. <laughs> no, it's it's so amazing, by the way. It's fascinating. We, we need to dissect this whole uh, term of covert operations because they're basically, in broad daylight, covert doesn't mean hidden. Covert just means denied uh, in full view. Uh, and so we have repeatedly events uh, like coups and overthrows and blowing up pipelines. And they just say, no, nah, didn't didn't happen. Uh, you know, I'll tell you another example of this. Uh, I was uh, briefly, uh, well, I was friends with the Aristide in Haiti, uh, and I briefly was trying to help him uh, in an absolutely impoverished place that needs help. Needed help, needs help. And he said to me, uh, Jeff, they're, they're going to take me out. They're going to take me out. Uh, and I said, oh, no, no, Mr. President, relax. We're going to take care of this. You know, pretty stupid and naive, I have to say, of, of myself. Uh, but I said, no, no, it's OK. We're going to work this out and so forth. Well, then, of course, uh, this is uh, George W. Uh, Bush Jr., uh, they cut off Haiti from IMF, World Bank, all the usual things for destabilization before the CIA finally moves in, often literally for the kill, or at least figuratively for the kill in the overthrow. Then one day, they, the U.S. ambassador walks in and guides uh, Aristide out to a plane with uh, the unmarked tail, and 23 hours later, he's in Central Africa. OK, this is what is known as a coup, uh, a, a CIA coup. So I, I know the uh, reporter that covers this beat in The New York Times, and I call her. And I said the next day, you're, you're not going to cover the coup. Uh, they walked the president out to an unmarked uh, tail, and, uh, fly him out to central. You're not. And she said, uh, Jeff, the the editor's not interested. That's that's <laughs> that's all all the news that's fit to print. Yeah. And uh, then I was, you know, America is a surreal place. The the uh, next Monday or Tuesday, I was testifying in Congress on a hearing where everyone was saying how they loved Haiti uh, and uh, you know would do everything and and how good it was that the U.S. had protected. Uh, the president of Haiti from harm's way because uh, there were belligerents that were coming to attack him. And then, of course, everything is completely f forgotten in the next hour, and that's the end of it. Yeah. So this is uh, typical for how things uh, act right now. And if you act with this impunity, if there is no accountability, the recklessness, the stupidity, uh, really, the imbecility of it uh, continues to expand. And that's where we are today. And it's extraordinarily dangerous because not only are we doing terrible things, but we're doing delusional things like uh, Blinken saying, uh, we are going to uh, uh, make sure that uh, NATO enlarges to Ukraine as uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are dying on, on the battlefield. And we have no way, plan, shape uh, or decency. <laughs> I mean, the whole idea is mistaken, but no way to do that. But what we are doing is guaranteeing that the war will continue. And, and by the way, speaking of Haiti, uh, the 20th anniversary of that coup was just uh, in February, uh, and we're still yeah. learning about it. France's ambassador at the time, recently, a few years ago, admitted that the, France and the U.S. orchestrated that coup uh, against Aristide. And by the way, that was the second time Aristide was overthrown in a U.S. back coup. Yeah, and, and by the way, I was at... Uh, Part diplomatic gatherings where people were bragging about this afterwards. Ugh. The Belgians, the French, you know, laughing about this stuff. 
and look at Haiti now. It's 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 descend it's it's descended into such absolute chaos, and yet nobody can trace it back to our critical role in destabilizing the country by overthrowing its first popularly elected president. You look all around the world; these actions destabilize places for decades, for generations. They're based on violence, uh, imbecility, and lies. They uh, suborn local leaders. They distort everything about local politics. Uh, And of course, there's zero accountability for the United States. And the legacy of this, look at Brzezinski's brilliant move of uh, putting uh, jihadists into Afghanistan in 1979. We're still now 45 years later, uh, a country completely destroyed for two generations, almost no understanding in the United States at all, uh, almost no connecting the dots of how this CIA operation back in 1979 has led step by step by step to unending chaos. Look at Iran, uh, which you mentioned, 1953, overthrowing a democratically elected government because somehow, weirdly, our oil had gotten under their sand, as they say. Uh, And uh, we've done this in so many places. And the legacy of it, uh, Libya, Syria, more recently, Ukraine is the same way. Uh, it, It poisons politics even for generations, because it's violent, it's so stupid in its direction, so arrogant and wrongheaded, it's done covertly, so-called, because what is being done is so far from what should be done that it's hidden and deniable from view. And so it's horrible policies done in a way guaranteed to poison the politics of these places for decades. You know, when I go to Southeast Asia, which is quite frequently, there are places today, you do, lots of places you do not walk because the unexploded ordinance of America's secret wars are all over the farmlands uh, in Laos, in Cambodia, until today. The U.S. government, by the way, is still trying to collect debt from a regime that had installed in place, destabilized the entire country, lent it money for emergency food aid, bombed the place relentlessly, and is trying to get repaid till today. Speaking of coups, you, of course, have traced the current war in Ukraine back to uh, 2014, and you say that the United States helped create that coup. Of course. And you were there uh, you said you saw things up close, uh, certain things up close and, and personal. Can you talk about some of the things that you were able to see because well, of your involvement in that region that others weren't able to see? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, w- the one thing that I saw was that um, immediately after the coup, I was called by the new government. I didn't know what had happened, but the prime minister said, I'd like to meet with you to discuss this economic crisis. And so I had advised the uh, government in uh, Ukraine back in uh, the early 1990s. And of course, the prime minister asked me and I went. And when I went, uh, I was taken around the Maidan where people were still milling around. And the American NGOs were around there. And they were describing to me, oh, we paid for this. We paid for that. We funded this insurrection. It Turn my stomach, by the way. I had my meeting, got on the plane, went home, and that was the end of that. But I saw the bragging. Now, US NGOs funding this uprising, they didn't do that on their own as nice NGOs. This is, uh, let's just say, off budget financing for a US regime change operation. And then uh, the Russians did us a, a good favor of helping us to understand what this was all about, because they intercepted the call between Victoria Newland and uh, and Jeffrey Piat, who was then the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, describing how they were going to put Yatsenuk, the prime minister, into power. This was weeks before. 
but they had already chosen him as the new prime minister. And he's the guy that called me uh, to ask me, you know, of course, I didn't know anything about this call at the time, but you can listen to it. And there it's the plotting. And by the way, how bizarre it is. It's online. Thank you to the Russian government for intercepting it, uh, giving us some insight into what the U.S. government does. And not a word of explanation from the U.S. from that date on. And basically, where are the reporters in the White House pool or in the State Department pool on any given day from February 2014 until today asking about that? And if they did, of course, they'd get that that indelible smirk of <laughs> Admiral Kirby uh, or of uh, Matt Miller, who can't even lie with a straight face because they're having such a good time with their idiocy. Uh, but they would deny that there ever was such a phone call. And it would be online and they would say, no, it doesn't exist. Uh, yes, but uh, Mr. Miller, it's right there. No, sorry, it just doesn't exist. And that's uh, and the New York Times would say there were unfounded allegations uh, that a call existed uh, and it was uh, linked to the following website, but this website obviously doesn't exist. That's how the New York Times would report it if it covered it at all. The, the counter argument you will get or, or th that I get from people who support the proxy war in Ukraine about the Newland call is that Newland was not plotting uh, the overthrow of the government. Newland was trying to work out who should serve with Yanukovych, who was then the current president, who Newland was trying to overthrow in a power sharing government. Because it is true that at the time Yanukovych offered the opposition in a bid to defuse the Maidan crisis, a power sharing deal. So Newland and Piet were just doing their part to plot about who should come in and serve alongside Yanukovych. The problem with that, first of all, is that uh, on the call, it shows that Newland and Piet are picking who should serve in government. So exactly. Just, it shows. Even, even if that's the interpretation, yeah. it's the U.S. is making a government, for yeah. God's sake. Come yes, on. Yes. And then that same made on movement that where they're deciding who should be the leaders are, they uh, ultimately the hardcore nationalist component of that made on movement rejected the power sharing agreement launched a coup with violence uh and without a sufficient quorum in parliament installed a new government and put yatsin yoku nulin had selected as a new leader so of course and by yeah. the way uh within 24 hours recognized by the united states exactly contrary to an agreement that was reached this yeah. is what's called a coup yeah. so uh whether it went exactly as was uh, expected on around, uh, I think, January 27th or so when this call uh, was made. We don't, I don't know the date exactly. It's unclear. I think it was posted in, uh, yeah. or it's claimed to be. Uh, BBC covers it uh, as if it's in, in early February. Yeah. But whatever it is, it's obnoxious as it is completely. Not Klitschko, we've got Yatsenuk. Yats is the guy. We're going to bring in... Uh, we're going to bring in the big guy, that means Biden, uh, to do the attaboy uh, on this. Uh, the United States is making the government of Ukraine, excuse me. <laughs> so that's a coup, by the way. And then when you find out that the Maidan was paid for, paid for by the U.S., okay, that's uh, another piece of it. And then, of course, I would love for the CIA to uh, show us the books and tell us what really happened. And now that Victoria Newland is my incoming colleague at Columbia University, I'm sure Awkward. she's going to. I'm sure she's going to give a seminar explaining all of the details of this. So I'll let you know what we hear in the Maybe seminar. Maybe she'll she'll give a baking seminar about yeah. how to make those cookies. She, she may she well do out. so. <laughs> Okay. Well, listen, we've we've covered some really important historical context, but let's turn to some of the present calamities. Uh, it's hard to know where to start. Yeah, where to start, right? Let me actually begin by asking you about Israel's strike on Syria recently, because they attacked the Iranian embassy in Damascus, uh, killing a very senior commander with the IRGC. Uh, what do you think Israel's goal was here? And, and, and what do you make of, you know, this new line being crossed, you know, bombing a diplomatic facility, which, you know, according to international law is actually the sovereign territory of the country that inhibits it. So basically, Israel is basically bombing Iran by doing this. Well, I, I think the line that Israel has really crossed is committing a genocide with the, the cameras rolling. 
uh, and uh, saying that we do so with complete impunity. Uh, and if the UN Security Council calls for an immediate ceasefire, we ignore that uh, entirely. Today's uh, explanation of uh, the bombing of, uh, uh, of, of the uh, food uh, relief uh, operations uh, was uh, AI systems uh, automatically uh, targeting thousands and thousands of uh, deaths and murder, knowing Israeli startups, that could uh, well be the case. Uh, but Israel has crossed so many lines uh, in this. Uh, it's a completely rogue operation. It's in complete violation of the 1948 Genocide Convention of the Geneva Codes of the UN Charter. One doesn't know where to start, but sending a missile uh, into Iranian uh, diplomatic uh, territory is uh, attempting to widen the war. I think the Israeli government is uh, extremely eager that their vassal state, uh, also known as the United States, uh, will join in a war against Iran. So I think the intention is to widen the war. What are the real intentions when you talk about hegemony, for instance? What does that mean in real concrete terms? Like, what does the U.S. want when it bleeds Russia? The U.S. wants to be in a situation that no government in the world opposes U.S. policies on anything, whether it's on economics or natural resource disposition or locations of pipelines uh, or, of course, uh, locations of military forces or governments that might tax U.S. companies. Anything that the U.S. would oppose Uh, The U.S. wants a subservient government. That's what hegemony means. Hegemony means uh, that you have a government that will do the U.S. bidding. And this is carried out uh, basically by the archipelago of U.S. uh, military forces uh, around the world. It's estimated at between 800 and 900 military bases in 80 countries of the world. So uh, the U.S. uh, basically, even in effect, occupies many of these countries. It seems strange, but when you have the U.S. military bases there, the governments are afraid to move against the U.S., uh, often for some pretty obvious reasons. But even even friendly uh, allied governments, even Japan, they're afraid of the U.S. Uh, And uh, it's a strange idea. It seems like an alliance, but it's not quite like that. So the U.S. wants to make sure that no one crosses the U.S. And what this means is that any large country is inherently an affront to U.S. hegemony. And two in particular right now, but there's a third one that will come this way, uh, are affronts to the U.S. Russia's too big for the U.S. and China's too big for the U.S. And so we hate them. We hate them because everything they do, we interpret in a way to generate the public hatred and fear. And so this is, by the way, uh, the out of the playbook of the British Empire, which was really the uh, tutor of the American Empire, because Britain uh, did all of this in the 19th century, what the United States started doing in the second half of the 20th century. Britain came to hate Russia in the 1840s, so much so that when Russia got into a tiff with the Ottoman Empire in 1850, uh, the the Brits stepped forward and said, time to invade Russia. Uh, And that was the Crimean War, which was 1853 to 1856. Very similar dynamics. By the way, this is the second Crimean War. It's almost to, to the playbook because the idea of the first Crimean War was surround Russia in the Black Sea, uh, deny Russia's access to uh, its uh, naval base in Sevastopol. Uh, Same story as today. Uh, Same words you hear from MI6, from uh, the British, uh, from the Ukrainians, we're going to attack Crimea. It's exactly (laughs) the, the repeat of 1853. But what was the reason for Russophobia of uh, Britain in the 1840s. Well, it wasn't communism. It wasn't Putin. It it wasn't uh, 
any of that. It was Russia was so big that it was an affront to British hegemony. And the crazy idea back in the 1840s, which moved public opinion, was the idea that Russia was going to invade India from Central Asia through the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan and take over Britain's crown jewel of empire. Of course, completely fantastical. It had absolutely nothing to do with what the Tsars wanted to do, with what Russia was capable or wanted to do, but it drove war. And this is what we have today, which is America asserts its right of control over everybody. They call it literally primacy or full spectrum dominance, uh, or I, we call it uh, hegemony. Uh, but whichever term one uses, the countries that are an affront to that are the enemy. And I mentioned that there's a third one. Right now, the U.S. is angling that India will be on our side against China. But India is a big civilization and country. And you can pretty much imagine the U.S. Uh, coming to see India as this great threat. Not today, 10 years, 20 years. It's, it's a dynamic which is absolutely awful. And by the way, uh, just to put put the scholarly uh, gloss on it, uh, uh, John Mearsheimer, uh, whom I'm uh, uh, very good friends with and I uh, admire a lot but disagree with very strongly on uh, a core principle, wrote a book uh, called uh, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. It's his great realist uh, foreign policy book of 2001. Um, and he wrote at the beginning, uh, we have good relations with China right now, but they will worsen. And uh, and he called it, by the way, you know, he called it entirely. I said at the time, why should they worsen? We have no, we have no trouble. No, no, they're going to worsen. Why are they going to worsen? Because China is going to become a major power. I said, yeah, okay, so no, 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 because then they'll worsen because then it's going to be a threat. He said, John, it's not a threat unless we make it a threat. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. He said, yeah, yeah. Right. He said, John, we got to stop the self-fulfilling prophecy. He says, you can't. So that's the difference of uh, the realists and me is I believe we could actually talk with each other and find peaceful approaches. But the point is hegemony means we control what we want to control, where we want to control it. We control which governments operate if a government is not to our taste, we replace it with war or with a covert regime change operation or some other subterfuge of the National Endowment of Democracy or some NGO that uh, uh, does uh, the politics for us. That's what hegemony means. As we're recording this, uh, Joe Biden has just had a phone call with Netanyahu and White House aides are doing the, the familiar dance of leaking to the press that Biden is angry, he's fuming, even though we've just gotten news from the Washington Post that on the same day that Israel killed those aid workers with the World Central Kitchen, Biden uh, sent uh, thousands more bombs to Israel. So that's an indication of how angry Biden is, claiming he's angry while sending Israel more bombs. But the White House has just put out a statement, you know, suggesting, I think for the first time, that they might condition their support for Israel on Israel's conduct, specifically with how it addresses civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. Uh, the White House statement says that Biden made clear, quote, that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. So they're saying now for the first time that they're going to actually shape their policy with consideration of how Israel acts. So they're going to actually tie their policy to Israel's actual conduct. We'll see if they actually do that. But here is White House spokesperson John Kirby speaking about this at the White House. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. That was really fascinating. So insightful. I feel so blessed to have spoken to uh, Dr. Sachs. A lot covered there. And uh, it's great getting into history. The problem is there's just so much to cover that it's yeah. hard to know uh, what to focus on because there's just so many disasters going on in the world right now. But few people are better equipped 
than Jeffrey Sachs to break it all down. So very grateful to him. Very grateful to you, our audience, for tuning in and supporting the show, which if you're not already a member, we suggest you think about it, consider it. Go to usefulidiotspodcast.com, support the show, get bonus content, including the extended version of this interview with Jeffrey Sachs. Where we talk about all sorts of interesting things, including the obsession with TikTok. And again, that's usefulidiotspodcast.com. See you there. See you next time. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at usefulidiotspodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at Useful Idiot Pod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe.